So I think we're just going to dive right into this today. First of all, Jessica, hi. Hi. How are you? Oh, I'm super good. How are you, babe? I'm doing good. I'm excited to be doing this podcast with you. Not only is it another podcast, but uh, I'm very excited to talk about this game. Yes, Masters of Mutant Night. It's been a favorite of ours pretty much since we got it. It's out of print, and we talked to the designer. It's not going to be back in print. So, you know, it sucks because it's not going to be available. But at the same time, it's really good, and it deserves to be talked about. If somebody comes across it, hopefully maybe they've heard this show before and they go, oh yeah, no, let me check that out. It's definitely worth checking out. This is a deck builder with card combat. It's been described as a spatial deck builder and we'll get into why it's called that in a minute. Jessica, why don't you give us the rundown? What is this game about? So in Masters of Mutant Night, you play a mutant in an unnamed city, and you're basically battling it out with all of the other mutants, trying to be the most powerful mutant. So the city is made up of a bunch of different area tiles. Each one has various items that you can use to your advantage, cars and trees and water towers that you can throw and use them to weaponize against your opponents. Each one also has power cards that you can pick up to add to your deck and enhance your abilities. And when you pick up power cards, you also gain Mutant Knight, which is the source of the power for all the mutants. And you can use that to actually upgrade and add some uh, recurring abilities. It's got very comic book hero villain kind of vibes. The general play is every man for himself, but there's also a co-op mode where everyone is kind of a team of heroes and you're playing against villains. So that's, I think that's called the villain mode. So you're basically just trying to become the most powerful and at the same time, kill all of the other mutants. It's a last man standing is the winner kind of game. So speaking of that comic vibe, Jess, I think that's what makes the game stand out to me the most. It's bright, it's colorful, it's cartoony, but it's not like kids cartoon. It's kind of like that grab your attention type of cartoon. It looks like a really well-drawn animated series. So props to whoever did the illustrations and the coloring, because it's what makes the game stand out first and foremost. Yeah, the artwork is really well done. And honestly, it's just really creative. The The different powers, the different mutants, um, they all have different kind of starting abilities. So they all have personalities and kind of how they start. But you can really build your character up to be whatever you want it to be. And that's really cool. I found the trick is to have a good mix of like range attacks and melee attacks. But there's also some defensive cards you can pick up, too, that can be very helpful, where you can avoid things that are thrown at you, or you can counter punch, which is really cool. Yeah, it's a really good mix of different types of cards in the deck, which makes it really interesting and really replayable, because every time it's going to be a different experience in terms of what's out there and what's available. Another thing I really like about this game, it's super interesting, is that when you have more than three players you're actually only battling against the people sitting to your left and right. It makes things less limiting because you can move around the board a lot more and not have to worry necessarily about getting potentially attacked by every single person on the board. You're only really fighting against your opponents, and that gives you more flexibility and freedom. Because I think it would be really overwhelming if you're having to deal with five different opponents at the same time, especially on such a small kind of area. There is still a possibility, though, that two players can gang up on another one, right? If the person to your left and to your right decide to just go after you, you can still get ganged up on that way. Oh, absolutely. And I think that you don't want to make the mistake of becoming too far, too powerful too quickly because it can really set you up as a target where people are going to want to come after you because then they're like, okay, well, this guy's clearly a threat. Let me just get him out of the way right now. But I think that's where the idea of it being a spatial deck builder comes into play. You don't necessarily want to be next to your opponents. I found that I've had really good success in this game by taking my character and moving them kind of away from the action and lobbying attacks in when it's most advantageous for me. 
It seems that initially the ranged attacks are more strategic, right? Because you have space between you and your opponents. They would have to move over to you to hit you. You might even be able to evade some of the things they throw at you. The melee attacks, though, are helped with a lot of elemental effects. And let's talk about some of the elements in this game. You have fire, you have water, you have electricity, you have poison, and you even have ice, which I know is your absolute favorite. I have a love-hate relationship with the ice, or it's called frost in this game. All of the elements in this game build up on each other, which is really cool, but also can really just fuck your day up. The frost, for example, when you get hit with a frost attack, you get a frost card in front of you. And it just does one damage to start. But every time you get a new frost card, it does one damage for every frost card that you have in front of you. And if you have any frost cards in front of you, you can't move diagonally. So now your movement is limited, so you're kind of stuck. And you're having every time they hit you it's exponentially stronger than the last time. And that can really just ruin your day really quickly. But it's kind of the same for the other elements too. The fire, it's, when you get hit with fire, it's more powerful if there's other fire in the space that you're in. Right, and then the electricity will hit you harder if there's more water in your area, but then the water can be used to douse the fire. You also have the toxic waste barrels you can throw at people, and there's other attacks that cause people to get poisoned. And the poison cards give you damage right away, and then they go into your deck, and then every time you draw them, you take that damage. If you're playing with melee, and you're using the elements in your favor, you can actually do a lot of really heavy-hitting damage. The only problem is you leave yourself vulnerable to an immediate counterattack. Yeah, it really just depends on what's out there, what you have as far as your abilities and what the other players have as far as their abilities. You have to kind of pay attention to all of it. But I found when you use the elements to your advantage, that's when you really kick some ass because then your your attacks go from one damage to 10 damage. And it really, you can just knock somebody out in one turn. It should be noted there is a card in your deck that allows you to get rid of all those frosts and poisons. And early on in the game, you kind of use it as like a throwaway. You use it to pick up items or you use it to move. But as the game goes on, that card is going to become more and more important. Do you think that there could have been one more card in your deck like that? Because I think one is enough. No, I think one is enough. I mean, you can only get rid of up to five things with the cleanse card. So if you build your deck so big that by the time you get it, you've got seven frosts in front of you, then yeah, you're kind of screwed. It doesn't really help you that much to only get rid of five of them. But at the same time, if you're strategic enough and you're not going too hard on the, the deck building, you usually can get it enough times that you're not becoming super overwhelmed and that it's able to clear pretty much everything away when it does come up. Yeah, you don't want to overload your deck, but that's the trick with deck builders though, isn't it? Like, when do I stop putting cards in my deck? It's hard because Maybe you do have a system of cards where it's like, all right, every time I draw my four cards up at the end of my turn, I know the next round is going to be kick-ass because I got this fire punch and then I got this poison thing. But if you stop picking up cards, you run out of opportunities to build up Mutantite and then you run out of opportunities to upgrade. But I think the game does a good job at pushing it towards its conclusion by the time you have a deck that you're really happy with so grabbing that mutant knight isn't as important by the end. What do you think? I think you're right. And I think that the game is well balanced in that you only have so many cards in your deck that allow you to pick up more cards. And you can only pick up cards when there's no opponents in the space that you're in. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, you can't pick up a card if it's an occupied space. I totally forgot about that. Yeah, it can be occupied by someone who's not your opponent. But if it is an opponent that's in the space, you have to fight them before you can pick up the card. You have to get them out of there. So because there are kind of limited opportunities to pick up cards, it's definitely balanced in that. It's hard to be in a place where you have too many cards in your deck. Let's talk about that Mute Knight, because when you build up Mute Knight, you have the option to use it for additional damage on certain cards that you draw into your deck, but you can also use it to give yourself special abilities that you can use throughout the game without having to draw certain cards. You can just tap into them whenever you want. 
I like this because it gives your character a little more of an edge. Let's say you are a character who wants to do a lot of melee attacks. You draw from the upgrade deck and let's say you're a melee player and then bam, do an additional three damage every time you hit your opponents with a melee attack. I want that card. That's really cool because you're building up your hero or your villain depending on how you wanna play. And you really get to create this character to be the ultimate badass, which is awesome. I always like to try to vary my skills, right? So if I already, if I started the game with a skill that helps me in a melee attack, I'll try to pick something up that's going to help me with ranged attacks. That way, no matter what, I'm having an advantage. But you don't always get that option. Um, you do get to choose between the top three cards when you are upgrading or mutating is what it's called in the game. But... It's not always going to be the three best card option. Sometimes you look at it and you're like, well, these aren't really useful at all for the kinds of things that I have in my hand. And you just have to sort of pick one and try to make it work. But usually there's at least one that's going to be cool and interesting for your character. All right. So it's got good artwork. The characters are really cool looking. The mechanics of it work really well. The fighting, the deck building, it's all cool. Jessica, is there anything about this game you would change? That's a tough one. In our experience, playing with two or three players, it's almost always whoever goes first that wins. Yeah, and why do you think that is? Because there's not much of an advantage to going first. Yeah, I, I really don't know. I mean, I guess it's because it's so balanced that it's hard to be much more powerful than everyone else so everyone's doing about the same amount of damage every turn well could it be that if everyone's doing the same amount of damage every turn the person who hits first obviously finishes that person off first yeah that would make sense it's just you would think the person that hits first well yeah they win that's right. I don't know what I was thinking. I was like backwards in my brain about it. But yeah, I think that's probably what it is. is the, whoever gets to make the first hit tends to be the first to take somebody out and the last one to get hit, at least for the fatal blow. Um, but when you have more people and the opponents are more spread out, it's a lot more of an interesting dynamic and definitely not so predictable, I would say. It changes the way you play for sure. I would say in a two-player game, you definitely have to use the elements more to your advantage. But putting all the fire on one side of the board, okay, now I'm just going to avoid that. I haven't really figured out the way to play this best with two players. Probably get some sort of healing effect that you can use so it puts you a little ahead of the game when you're trading damage. But in a three or four player game, it's it's more about where you are on the board and then making your opponents decide, okay, do I chase you and leave myself open to a different attack or do I focus on what I have going on here and see what I can do my next turn? Yeah, it's definitely a lot easier to kind of trick people into going into the spaces where you can use the elements to your advantage when there's more players on the board. Right, so I think we've talked about this game as much as we can when it comes to what goes on the board. I think one of the reasons this game works so well and there's so much replayability with it, because it's a battle game, it really has a lot to do with who you're playing sitting across the table from you. So it's not so much the mechanics of the game. They're fairly straightforward and easy. It's how your opponent is going to utilize them against you I think that's what makes the game work because half of what's going on is actually happening off the board. That's absolutely true. And I think that's part of what makes it great too, is that you really have an opportunity to put your own flavor on the game. And it's gonna be a different experience depending on who you've got across the table. So there you go. That is Masters of Mute Knight, the spatial deck building game. Very, very unfortunate. This was pretty much a Kickstarter exclusive at this point because it's a really fun game. I'm surprised it's not getting a reprint, but if you can find it, definitely give it a, a shot. If you know someone who has it, give it a play. I, I don't think you're going to be disappointed. That's all we have for today. Thanks for checking out today's episode. We will catch you later.